Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Can everyone hear me well enough? Yeah. We don't have any amplifiers here, so we'll just yeah. do as is. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. We really appreciate you being here. My name is Mary Ellen O'Neill. I'm the co-chair of 01867 Neighborhood Preservation. This is Kathy Greenfield. She's the other co-chair of the association. We'll be doing a presentation tonight with the agenda includes a background on what's been, what has happened, an update on what's going on now, um, a presentation that Kathy will do on a new tool that we may have available for historic preservation, uh, what we're going to be doing going forward, and then we'll have a question and answer period for everyone uh, to take part if they'd like. Uh, with us tonight is our state senator, Jason Lewis. Thank you, Jason, for coming tonight. We appreciate it. <laughs> and also with us is Joe Demers, a representative and an aide with uh, Representative Jim Dwyer. Who, uh, <laughs> thank you both. Um, our, uh, the Board of Selectmen Representative Dan Ensminger had to step across uh, town for another meeting, but he is the member of our Board of Selectmen who is the liaison with the Historical Commission. Um, let's uh, review what's happened. In July, the neighborhood learned that the owner of 186 Summer Avenue, shown up here in the barn is in the back, had filed an application for a demolition <coughs> permit for both structures the house and the barn, both of which are on Reading's architectural, excuse me, historical and architectural inventory. This request triggered a review by the Reading Historical Commission. They held a public hearing on July 24th. At this meeting, the public learned that the buyer, oh, the seller rather, had, and the buyer, <laughs> um, had signed a, a purchase and sales agreement uh, for an undisclosed amount of money uh, the buyer at this uh, is known as uh, Criterion Child Enrichment. They are based in Milford, Mass. And I'll give you a little more information about them. In the application, the seller named Criterion's owner as her agent in this process. Um, why would Criterion want to set up its offices in a residential location? And how can they do that? Massachusetts has a law commonly referred to as the Dover Amendment, which allows nonprofit religious and educational organizations to override local zoning. It also gives them the added benefit of a reduced site plan review by uh, any local planning board. Criterion, Child Enrichment is the official name of the agency, we'll refer to it as Criterion, uh, defines itself as one of the largest providers of child and family development services in the Commonwealth. They have 12 locations statewide, including um, its headquarters in Milford. All 12, lo some um, locations only offer specific programs, most of which are in Central Mass, but all 12 locations offer its largest program, which is its early intervention program. Nearby offices are located in Woburn and in Malden. Here are some photos of its, uh, several of its existing offices. This is the one in Gardner, Wittensville, the uh, Commercial Street in Malden, Palmer. Oh. Did we show the one in Woburn? And Woburn. Okay, thank you, Kelly. With a demo application, supporting documentation was submitted by Criterion's architectural consultant, Maxwell Architects from, from Somerville. Excuse me. Included in that was a chart indicating the amount of space. Uh, that it wants to put on the site and its components for what they call Criterion Reading Early Childhood Enrichment Program. It calls for a 9,900 square foot one level office building, a 2,400 square foot secured playground and 20 parking spaces. The next slide shows a sketch of those items to scale over the current site. Um, as you can see here in the dotted line, excuse me, this is the house and the barn. So this would be, I mean, we don't know how they plan to arrange it, but if you, uh, there's the <coughs> 9,900 square foot office building, 20 parking spaces, and the playground on the back. That includes, <coughs> there are three lots there. This includes them all as one lot, the whole space. Um, the next slide shows an aerial view of the site. Right now, you can see the house at the <coughs> top left, 
and the barns would have been the center and the long driveway, the trees along the back between that and Parker. And this, the slide after that shows that concept of super, again, superimposed over that site from an aerial view. And this was done by a survey company in Stoneham. <clears throat> uh, right now, Criterion has not um, submitted any additional plans to the town. Once it does, it has to formalize more plans. It, um, that will trigger a submission to uh, town council of all materials that ta our town council needs to determine whether or not it will qualify under the Dover Amendment. So what's happening now? We have formed the organization I talked about, Owen 867 Neighborhood Preservation. What we would like to do is to preserve the historic buildings on the site and keep it as a residential, and keep it for residential use. We also would like to find alternatives for the buyer so that she realizes the revenue that she, <coughs> she needs and wants from the sale of her property. And to find alternative locations in Reading for the buyer. We welcome criteria to Reading but not at the cost of destroying a rich, the rich historic character of the neighborhood and the historic buildings that are there that really many people, not just the people that live on Summer Avenue, do enjoy and appreciate having. So how are we going to go about this? First, we're going to let the community know what's going on and what's at stake. We are putting up lawn signs. We have a website and a Facebook page. We're doing fundraising to help with these expenses and with the legal costs. That is going to be very key. We need the lawyers to help us in this um, this uh, fight. We have hired two lawyers, one who's a specialist in Dover Amendment issues, and the second is a local attorney with extensive experience in local zoning and site plan issues. We also have a committee working to develop residential options for the seller and a committee working on alternative locations for the buyer that would be more suitable for a professional business. We are also working with the Reading Historical Commission. The Reading Historical Commission has done a site um, walk through the buildings. Um, they have voted to support, of course, the continuance of those buildings. They don't want to see those buildings demolished. And they support continued residential use on the site. Members of that, of that commission are also working to develop alternatives for the seller and buyer, and we are keeping in close touch with them. In the meantime, another possible path to help preserve the historic character of the neighborhood has been evolving. And Kathy's going to talk with us about that. It's called the Local Historic District. Kathy? Okay. Uh, there are still a couple of seats up here if anyone wants them. Only two. <laughs> but we appreciate everyone being here tonight. I don't usually have a, cho uh, a problem raising my voice. But if I get too quiet, just shout and I'll speak up. Um, so Mary Ellen just explained our chief goal of preserving the home and the character of the neighborhood on Summer Avenue, and she gave you a broad overview of how we're going about that. Um, the one specific thing that I'm going to talk about um, that's going on is um, at the same time that we're building support and looking at alternatives, there's a process underway to establish a local historic district along a portion of Summer Avenue. Um, I'm going to tell you what a local historic district is, how it differs from um, other uh, other historic designations because a lot of people think that these properties are already protected and they're not. Um, and also briefly outline the steps that it's going to take to create a district, uh, which town bodies are involved in that, and uh, how you may play a role and where we are in that process. Um, so Massachusetts has, Massachusetts has a state law, it's called the Historic District Districts Act that allows municipalities by town meeting vote or city council, however the towns run, um, to establish local historic districts, which then operate under the provisions of the state law. Um, so they're relatively consistent across the state, local historic districts are. Um, a local historic district is the strongest pre protection offered to historic st structures. If I say historic too many times. <laughs> um, because it allows for local control over the character of the defined area. Um, because once it's established, a district is then overseen by a local commission. Reading already has a local historic district. You, know, you may know of it or live in it, the West Street Historic District. Um, and that came about because in 2005, 
the town took advantage of the state law, passed a local uh, bylaw that allows it to establish local historic districts and establish the West Street Historic District. Um, and once the bylaw is in place, it's easier to add additional districts because you don't have to go through all the other the process of establishing the bylaw. You just need the support to create a new district. Um, and just keep in mind going forward as I talk, because I do we do say historic a lot and historical a lot, that there are two different commissions. There's a local historic district commission, which oversees the district. Um, this being the, the, what's on the slide is the proposed Summer Avenue district, um, which you probably can't read that from here, but it would run from Summer Avenue from the light at the UU Church and including the house on Hoover Street um, to just past King Street to include the house known as Wisteria Lodge. Um, so just keep in mind that the Local Historic District Commission is one thing and it's separate from the Historical Commission whose responsibility is the overall uh, preservation plan for the town and enforcing the demolition bylaw. Um, so back to the Local Historic District being the strongest protection, um, that confuses a lot of people. I say, well, what about National Register? I thought it was a National Register property or I thought that house was already in a, a historic district. Why isn't it protected? And so I'm going to compare for you quickly uh, the difference between National Register properties, uh, the town inventory, and a local historic district. So you see a National Register plaque up there. You've seen those on homes and buildings. They're some, a concept anyway that people are relatively familiar with. In the middle, the sheet on the bottom is a, a inventory sheet. In Reading, we call this collection of sheets or this set of sheets the historical and architectural inventory or the inventory and that's maintained by the historical commission and archived at a state level um, it's literally an inventory it's a record keeping of historic properties and then we have local historic districts like the West Street district and the proposed Summer Avenue district so these are the different levels of protection that are offered at each of these levels the National Register offers no protection to historic homes, zero. It's an honorary designation that just recognizes that a property has historical significance, but it, there's no protection. The town inventory, just being on an inventory in general, doesn't offer any protection, but here in Reading, it offers some protection because um, here we've tied our demolition delay by law to the historic inventory. So all properties on the historic inventory are subject to a six month delay on a demolition permit, which gives time for um, figuring out options and seeking alternatives, which what's, is what, ha what is happening now. But it can't stop a demolition. It's just a speed bump. And then there's a local historic district. And once it's established, a local historic district puts in place a commission, as I said, whose primary role is to review exterior alterations to properties in the district. Um, including some building alterations and demolitions. Um, so, so what are the benefits of a local historic district? I think they seem, they're pretty obvious to me. Um, it can protect, a local historic district can protect buildings from demolition. And it also guides appropriate changes to structures, uh, usually in the form of review of materials and styles and scale, et cetera, of, of alterations. So this way, the built environment can remain, the built environment, the historic built environment, can remain a viable part of the community. Um, in the case of Summer Ave, it can ensure that, you know, what we love most about it is preserved for the, for the future and enjoyed in the same way that we enjoy it today. Um, but here's my take, my takeaway for the benefits. And the one phrase that I keep repeating is local control, um, that we can have local control. Because we as residents, and probably even the town government, though I can't speak for them, are vulnerable and somewhat defenseless against when it comes to state regulation that overrides local zoning um, and the bylaws that we put in place and allows a commercial enterprise to insert themselves wherever they want, like under the Dover Amendment or even 40B. Um, and it's frustrating. And the residents of Summer Avenue want to take back that control, and the state allows it. The state says, pretty much says, if it's that important to you as a community, take control, claim it, 
create a district by town meeting vote. You just all have to agree that that's the right thing to do and take control and maintain the local character. Um, it's a trump card, if you will. And uh, I think it's one that we're ready to play so that we can decide what's best. Um, the process that we have to go through and that we're in the middle of right now is a study takes place and a, a preliminary report is prepared. <coughs> the body that the town body that's doing that is the West Street Historic District Commission. Because um, under the state law, if you already have a local historic district, that's who, who then uh, creates new districts. And that report was submitted on August 25th to the state, to the Mass Historical Commission, and to our own local planning board, the CPDC. And then there's a 60-day waiting period, um, which allows for education of the property owners in the district and uh, comments from, those, from the state and from our local planning board. At the end of the 60-day period, the West Street Historic District Commission will hold a public hearing, and uh, that'll be the end of this, the, um, sort of the comment period, and they will issue their final report, uh, which we expect will be prim pretty much like their preliminary report. Um, and that's what town meeting will vote on on November 10th, on creating that district that you saw on the first slide uh, with any alterations that may take place in the next 60 days. Um, after that time, uh, standard operating procedures for the Attorney General to approve all town meeting actions, so then there'll be some waiting period after November 10th um, before the district is actually created. So what we're asking, uh, what will be asked of people, the, the big, the most important upcoming step is the town meeting on November 10th. And if you're a town meeting member, um, the West Street Historic District Commission will ask you to please support their article, and we as a citizens group will implore you to support the article. Um, and if you're residents and not town meeting members, uh, we ask you to urge town meeting members to support the article. Um, you can find out who town meeting members are on the um, town's website and the clerk's office uh, under town meeting. There's a list of town meeting members, and you can find out who they are, who's in your precinct, and ask them to support the article. And if you need any more information uh, from us beyond tonight or as things develop, you can keep track of us on our Facebook page, on our website, which is 01867NP.com, and by emailing us at 01867NP at gmail.com. Thank you, Kathy. So going forward, we need your help. Uh, we ask you to please sign up uh, on our email list to receive periodic updates about what's going on. Uh, if you'd like, we are going to be getting more lawn signs in. We have a separate form for that if you'd like to put a lawn sign in your front yard. We do have the Facebook page, so like us on Facebook and we get update, and you can get updates through that also. Uh, information on how to make a donation can be found on our website. Also, as Kathy said, please contact your town meeting members, uh, perhaps beginning in October, to ask them to support this um, local historic district. We also have a petition at the back of the room that we would like to get as many signatures as possible that we're going to send to Criterion to their board members and uh, share with our uh, own town board of selectmen. So lend your voices, your ideas, and um, you know, help us however you can. We appreciate your coming tonight. We'd be happy to take any questions or that you may have. Yes? Uh, two things. Uh, what's the assessed value of the property right now? And then would it be on or off the tax rolls should criteria prevail? Yes, well, let me see. We can look it up. Can you look up on I don't know specifically. It's around, the property now is valued, valued at around 700000 the, the There's the lot with the residence in the barn. And then there's two other separate lots that are very, you know, they're not valued as building lots, so they don't you know, contribute to so that assessment. So we're talking $12,000 a year property taxes. Correct. So wherever Criterion goes, they will not be paying. For, they will not be paying taxes, hmm. right? Unless you know, if, if they purchase the property, right? Any other questions? Yes, hi, Ann. I I do have some questions. Um, I think you said that until they file a plan, you can't get any opinion from the town attorney on the Dover Amendment. Why is that? Uh, that's just what the town manager had told us that that is how the process works. They need more definitive plans. Oh, one of the questions is, what is Criterion actually going to be doing yeah. in the off in the building? 
So for instance, they have two sites, uh, Milford and South Hadley, that clearly are educational. They provide early childhood education. Whether or not they're providing education, uh, which is what you need, it's one of the things that you need to qualify under the Dover Amendment, needs to be determined what they're going to be doing at the Reading site. So it's not known to us yet. We are going to be asking our attorney to look into that and see if they will. Criterion, let me put it this way, has not been very forthcoming when they were at the public hearing on the demolition delay, um, not answering questions very openly and honestly. So we're going to have to dig a little on that, but we need to find out um, what they're actually going to be providing at this proposed uh, site. Can I ask you a couple more questions? Sure. So with regards to the um, town attorney, the Historical Commission is a part of town government and they should be able to ask for assistance from the town attorney. Um, is that forthcoming? And I'm wondering if the selectmen have taken a position on this because I know that when the um, that really big development was going in up on Main Street, it was a 40B and the selectmen were um, very supportive and did everything that they could to make that not happen. So I'm wondering if the Historical Commission being a town body has had access to the town attorney as a town body and as part of their work and um, wondering what the Slackman's position is. I, I just have a couple more questions I'll ask and then I'll stop. Um, well, is no, it all, well, let's, well, no, let's okay, get to go ahead. Okay, yeah. Oh, I assume that the Historical Commission unfortunately is probably the only uh, committee or commission in town, well there might be another one, uh, the Climate Committee, that doesn't have staff assistance at their meetings. Even the volunteers take notes. Yeah. So, uh, that being said, I'm sure if they had a specific question that they would could submit through our town manager, if he would pass it on to the town attorney. Okay. Um, and the follow-up? Okay. Well, it was just on whether or not- Oh, the board of selectmen. Uh, they're in a different position with this, with this organization than they are with the 40B development, I think, because they have to be very careful uh, they do not want to do anything that will put them in the position of being sued. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the Dover Amendment has been interpreted very broadly. Um, and it's, it's, it's to prevent discrimination. Um, I don't think it was ever intended to take historic homes in the process, but nonetheless, it hasn't been reviewed in many, many years. It was initially adopted in 1950 with an update in the 1970s, and there's been no statewide review of that uh, since, so. And um, one town, more question then we'll... Okay, town meeting, um, is it definitely on the warrant because I saw the selectmen's um, meeting when they were discussing it and there was some question over who was actually going to sponsor it. So are the selectmen <coughs> sponsoring it or is it, the warrant closes on like the 29th? September uh, 23rd, I think. 23rd. I believe the warrant closes on the 23rd and the um, my understanding is that the West Street Historic District Commission would sponsor the article. And if they can't, the Historical Commission would. Or does it need to be the selectmen? No. I don't know that it needs to be, no. but there was some. There'll be a placeholder on the warrant because the public hearing will not have taken place and the report won't be final until closer to town meeting. But um, they will uh, have a placeholder on the warrant for the article. Thank you. Question. There's been several test cases, uh, Regis College for one, and uh, there's a couple of multi, is our attorney the one we've hired, is he uh, aware of these types of things, or I mean, is that what he specializes? The, the attorney that oh, the we have hired? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I can tell you. You can tell me yeah. about Art. Yeah. Well, his name is Art Krieger, he's in Cambridge, and that is the reason that we hired him for this, this part of the, the battle. Mm -hmm. so a couple of the, he, um, he represented the neighbors in Belmont when the uh, the Mormon temple, right. the, the height of the Mormon temple was, was um, in question. And he's represented um, neighbors in Newton when BC was doing making changes to their campus. He's done a lot of um, local work on the Dover Amendment. If I understood correctly, you're saying the historic district protection holds for exterior appearances. And not, not the interior. Right now. Uh, how about the use? I mean, could they put this to the property to a, a use consistent with their It doesn't. It doesn't. It won't help the use. So it's, it's an excellent, excellent question. Can you just repeat that you question? Repeat question? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the question was whether the um, 
the local historic district would protect the use of the land. And it doesn't. It, the, uh, the zoning, the Dover Amendment protects the, the user, if you will, um, on the land use. In other words, it's a, it would allow a commercial use in a residential area. The historic district um, does not, cannot um, review the land use. It can only review the exterior of the structure that's there. So it can't prohibit the use. Um, we're hoping by, for a couple of reasons that creating a district would either um, cause Criterion to leave the deal and just might make their life more difficult on Summer Avenue and more expensive. And if they really are a nonprofit, that, that could be a problem. And um, if not, if, if they do decide to stay, despite the local historic district, it would give a great deal of control over, um, over what they could do there, including potentially not demolishing the building. Does that make sense? I, I suppose the, um, I was thinking the uh, old running gymnastics academy proposal that turned out to be thinking about it because it's turned down. First of all, it's a county initiative, it's not a commercial initiative. Um, but it's, and what the big issue is, is, is parking and traffic and so forth. Now, if we're talking about education at this property, uh, I was just wondering if it were to go through, is there any way to? Actually, stymie it. Is there any zoning control at all because of the traffic issues and uh, parking? Or yeah. We don't have all the specifics on that. They are working, even in order to submit their plans, Criterion is working with the Historical Commission so that if they um, are allowed to go in under the Dover Amendment, that they will maybe work to adopt some of the architectural features of this building. Um, they have limited site plan review, so um, the, it can work on dimensional control and height, but they're not going to be required to do anything specific in that area. They've also, my understanding is that they're exempt unless out of their goodwill they would want to do even a traffic study. So they get a lot of benefits from the Dover Amendment. Excuse me, Karen? We know county improves this November. How long before it goes to state unless it comes back to its official? Is it official immediately? The Attorney General's office has 90 days to approve, which would put us just past the end of the demolition delay. But every indication just from prior um, Attorney General approval of town meeting action is that it would happen in less than 90 days. And we would have, um, we would be doing what we can from our end to make sure that it gets through before the end of the demolition. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it would be possible to uh, present a question to uh, the attorney, our attorney, uh, I believe his name was Krieger, about the feasibility of a class action lawsuit against them for diminution of value uh, to all the surrounding uh, property owners, because clearly what they're going to do is devalue our property. So, you know, if they, if they want to do that to us, I, I think, you know, clearly that's enough a method of last resort, but I think if they know that it might potentially be extraordinarily expensive for them to, to take this property, that maybe they'd, they'd look for a more suitable uh, venue. Well, we, I was told by someone, but yet I can't, sorry, I can't remember who it was I was speaking to, that the only people that could actually apply for devaluation of their home would be immediate abutters for civil court. I have no idea if that's correct, but I think there'd be a limit actually to that. You know, certainly worth considering and we'll, we'll Mark that down. Lorraine? That was a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, separately, can anybody tell me if they know if Criterion was it on the bidding process for um, Reading Gymnastics Academy building? Because. Uh, I understand that. Oh, was, um, was Criterion involved in bidding for the property um, at the former Reading Gymnastics site? Uh, our, our understanding is that they looked at it but uh, felt that it didn't meet their needs. And that is back how we do they are on the market. The reason the reason I ask that question is because if we talk to people, you know, throughout town, everybody's knee-jerk reaction is why there? You know, why in this beautiful district on the summer app, you know? So my question is, how did they get there? You know, why did they end up knocking on Debbie Stackpole's door asking, you know, offering her um, a lot more money than she ever would have gotten on the open market by, you know, a young family coming in wanting to renovate her home. 
because it's in such disrepair. Um, so I just wonder if there's any kind of weirdness going on in the back alleys. Let me say this, and we're trying to keep away from personal names, so we really want to be able to work with the owner and work with the buyer and to see if we can come up with other options. Uh -huh. So all I can say is it's a mystery. The, the criterion representatives claimed that they had been looking for five years in this area for a site that would meet their needs and that they did want a residential setting. Um, hmm. So they have been looking for five years and this is what they came up with. We really don't want to go into anything that we know about the background of how this developed, but it's primarily a mystery. And that's all I can say about it. That's all I really know. I think it's, um, a, it's a question that frequently is getting asked. It is asked because we just don't know the answer. I don't think we'll maybe yeah. ever know the answer. Mm -hmm. Rob? Uh, Mary, let me just mention one thing. The lot that we're, that's in question, it's a, an acre and a half in size. Fairly substantial. In a residential area where it is, its value is X. If you were to go to a commercial area and try to buy an acre and a half <coughs> of land, you're talking probably double, if not more. And a good, you know, and even you, you point to the chair, I mean, to the uh, to the gymnastics studio. That was what, 1.4, I think it was it was on the market for, and we kind of collectively believe this is going to come in, or it's agreed to, under a million. That's just th through some, um, uh, some, 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 some information that was put out on Facebook that, that you know, they're buying it for less than a million. So one of the reasons, you know, that they're, that they're wanting to be here <laughs> is because of the cost or the reduced cost to them because they can shoehorn into that because of the Dover Amendment, or at least they believe they can. So that's kind of one of, they, they claim, and you may hear this, uh, you know, future, uh, that they've been looking for five years. Well, it, it's because they've been looking in residential areas for, you know, an acre and a half of land that they can do this to. And it's pretty hard to find, especially around here. Well, it's happened at the Goddard School is on a residential site. Montessori School on West Street is on a residential site. Those were Dover Amendment, you know, protection cases. And the only way to stop them is not changing your zoning, but you can't stop a historical district. Right, because they will override any zoning that you that you place. Mm -hmm. That zoning, the underlying zoning, as far as I understand, remains. So that will always be residentially zoned, but they could use it for their educational and religious purposes if they get Dover Amendment, amendment protection. We have a question right behind us. Uh, as a nonprofit agency, who are they getting their funding? Are they getting it from um, the taxpayers through grant money, or what? Is there a way to find that? Well, look that up on their programs online. Uh, it depends on their program. Um, one program is from, they have a special grant for newborn home visiting in two communities. And that's a special grant from a foundation that they're doing. And it's very limited with their, that program. Um, their school programs are tuition and vouchers from the Department of um, Education at the state level. And the early intervention is insurance companies and contracts with the Department of Public Health. So it's a combination of funding sources, and maybe they do some fundraising too. Is there a way to get in touch with the insurance agencies or other people that we can start writing letters to, showing that we don't support the, the school in that area? Well, it, as far as we know, it's not really a school. So it is more of a social services agency. We have to, it has to be determined what component, if any, they have of education. That has, is one of the things <coughs> the town council will have to review. If, if our understanding is that they're considering moving their moving location where they rent to. Summer Avenue, if they do that, it's primarily, you know, occupational therapists, physical therapists, it's, it's, you know, developmental services that are needed and we have no issue with that. They're definitely needed and used by people in our community. It's more the location. So I don't think that's a particularly helpful avenue to go down, but, but thank you. Yes. In the back. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, is, is Debbie Sackville being represented by a broker? And if so, do you know that broker? We are not going that. That, I mean, I'm sorry, but that, <laughs> I'd rather not, that's, you know. Well, let me just answer the question. Why not? Yeah. And you don't have to answer it, but at least you want to.
source of a lot of contention and a lot of um, unfortunate name calling that, you know, and there's been claims that, you know, th that people have been being harassed, which our group has been taking every effort to follow all the guidelines. We are, um, we had a protest file with the town with the lawn signs. We worked that out in our favor. We're trying to keep them, for instance, in people's yards. We just want to work with the community because people are watching us and people will jump on anything that we say or do. This is a very sensitive and very personal you know, issue for a lot of people. And we have to be careful about that. And I really do not want to get into personal names. I just, that's, I just feel flat out that's the way it has to be. It, it won't serve any purpose. It's just, we'll, can turn into some mudsling and that's not where we're going. But I could talk to you after, but I'm not gonna say <laughs> We're not going to say it's then the TV there, is the camera right there. There are a lot of people from our group here tonight from a 1867NP, right? Raise your hands. Ask any of them. <laughs> John. Yeah, uh, two quick ones. Has the zoning board weighed in at all? And have we asked them to weigh in? They're not, there's nothing they can there's have nothing done. There's nothing yet. to be looked at. Because my understanding, part of the, el the elements of the Dover Act is they have to abide by the town, like parking, zoning requirements and things like that. So there's a lot of issues that way. And the second question I'd like uh, three folks, and kind enough for the senator to show up here, and I appreciate that. Could he and the representative look into the state funding question? Because I think that's a, you know, we're, we're, we're funding ourselves. If they're getting state money, I would think that would be an issue. Well, they're, pri they're, they're considered a private nonprofit, and they get they have contracts with those different state agencies. Um, I'm not sure what, I don't know. Uh, Jason, would, or um, Joe, would so, you might be able to answer that? Yeah, I'm learning about this as, as you all are. This is the first time you know, I've been exposed to a situation like this. So my office has been starting to research it as well. And um, my understanding so far is it wouldn't make any difference you know, what the sources of funding are. As long as they qualify in terms of an educational nonprofit, they would come under the Dover Amendment. And then to the earlier question that was asked, I think it was the lady over here in terms of why they can't be um, uh, the town, town council can't act on it yet. This gets to the um, issue of knowing exactly what's being proposed by Criterion because the Dover Amendment. The, there was a, um, uh, as you alluded to, it's very complicated. There's been you know uh, various uh, statutes here as well as court cases, and the most recent was a 1993 Supreme Judicial uh, Court decision. And it does get at the issue of reasonable reasonableness, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm sure there are lawyers in the room, and you know, reasonable reasonableness as a as a legal definition. So it does. It isn't that they can uh, come in and just do whatever they want. They, you know, there is a set of criteria in terms of what's considered reasonable when it comes to setbacks and size and scale. Um, so they, you know, that's why it gets a little more complicated and where council and zoning board would come into play, but none of that happens until obviously, you know, uh, Criterion would have filed you know, detailed claims. Question about the back, like, like 40B, there's certain limits that we have that we have to meet Criterion, since you mentioned that there's already two other Dover exemptions in town, does that not hinder us from having more? I mean, no. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's, unfortunately, it's not like 40B, where okay. once the community hits the 10 percent, then yeah. they aren't, you know, subject to a 40B. Um, it's it's not like that. <coughs> How do we repeal that? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to ask that question. <laughs> We've been looking at, I mean, I know Rep Dwyer's been looking at 40B for five years now. So it's, it's very difficult. One of the biggest issues in my uh, Senate district is the Weiss Farm development in Stoneham, which is a huge 40B uh, development that I'm strongly opposed to, and many others. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is our, our, and you mentioned this right, our state zoning laws are so outdated. Um, both 40B and the, the Dover, the last time that was updated was 1975. I mean, think about how the world has changed since then. And a lot of this is unintended con consequences, I think. So it definitely does need to be there. There are zoning reform proposals before the state legislature. Um, they are very controversial, and um, you know, nothing has moved in recent years. Um, but I, 
think that, that, unfortunately, I don't think that helps us here in this situation because of the time it takes, but I certainly think that's uh, something that, um, you know, I'll be looking at with Representative Dwyer and Representative Jones. Okay. Thank you. This gentleman right here? Yes. Um, a lot of people here are interested in what they can personally do to help delay this project or stop this project. I wonder if I could come to the front of the room and just say a few words about Criterion. About what? Criterion. About the Criterion, the bio. You would like to? Yes. All based on fact. All based on fact. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And your name, please? My name is Larry McHugh. I live at 205 Summer Avenue. And uh, I've got a beautiful view of the home in question, and also the home across the street from me, which is the former Coolidge House. And uh, we lived here over 50 years. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Criterion. And I do want to mention the name of the buyer. The name of the buyer is Robert F. Littleton, Jr. Why don't you remember that name? Mr. Littleton, or as Dr. Littleton, is a doctor of education. He is a very, very successful businessman. He has three properties all located on Fortune Boulevard. Not Las Vegas, but in Milford, Mass. And Fortune Boulevard is an industrial area. My approach is a little different than what the Historical Society is doing and talking about trying to get the seller to back down. I think the proper approach is to get the buyer to back down. Mr. Uh, Littleton, or as his friends call him, Bob, is a very, very successful businessman. His three properties that he owns, they are all in the educational field, but they have a total of 700 employees. My approach would be if everybody in this room would personally send a letter to Bob. First of all, congratulate him. He just had his 65th birthday. <laughs> and uh, as you know, when you get to be 65 years old, you start getting Medicare. And one of the things also you start thinking of is if you're a successful businessman, is what's going to be in a, your obituary when the Boston Globe writes it. And you don't want to think the first thing that's going to be in there is what happened in Reading, Massachusetts <laughs> to your whole beautiful career. So if you take the time just to talk, his, his, his home address, his telephone number is all public knowledge. His business telephone numbers are all public knowledge like that. His email address I've got if you want that. But the main thing is a personal letter from each of you in this room would certainly get him to start thinking, I don't need this. I really don't need this. Let me, I've never had to deal with this situation before. I'd like to think this over and start over again. He was, he was, uh, he's a Virgo, and Virgos sometimes like to think things through a little bit more. <laughs> and, uh, I think if we put a little pressure on him by just dropping a letter, a telephone call, a nice thing, Friendly, as, as we mentioned here, we don't want to get into a, a uh, pay match. Uh, we do want to talk to him and, and let him know what we're going through as people that live in that area, or live in this town, and what this town stands for. As is mentioned, we don't mind it going into an industrial area or anything like that. But come to think of it, when they do put a building in there, it's got to meet code, and code has to be handicap code and all fire prevention like that. It's not going to look anything like the buildings that are there now. So if you want to stop this project, get the buyer to back down. And that's what I suggest doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do want to make clear that that's definitely one of the things that we want. Yeah. We're saying to develop alternative options. We definitely want them to both back away, step back on the sign, purchase and sale. Questions? Paul. Has Criterion closed on the property, or is it contingent upon approvals, what happens? I mean, what is the status of the sale and purchase? It's under purchase and sale, but we don't know any terms of the purchase and sale. Um, they, they won't divulge them. They said in a public meeting that it's none of our business. And, and has anything happened since that public meeting with, uh, they had, People there say the plans are going to be developed in 10 days. Have they, they said they were, uh, they were uh, at the July 24th public hearing of when the demolition delay was imposed. They did say between six and eight weeks they hope to have more specific plans. Uh, we just found out that they are meeting with the Historical Commission tonight uh, because the Historical Commission, although they have said, uh, and, they, and not although, but they have said they want residential use and the buildings maintained, they do have to also work with them as to if they um, 
don't go away and they stay, they do want to work with them about what they'll keep, if anything, of the building. So, I mean, it's kind of a you know double-edged sword going on at the same at the same time. So, Ariel, would we have the ability through any of the zoning to um, restrict their usage and just say, you know, you're not able to use this on the weekend. The lights need to be turned down at a certain time. That their landscaping needs to be consistent with the neighborhood. Anything along that line. Well, we only know that the Dover Amendment allows them re elements of a reduced site plan. So mm -hmm. at this point, we're just not sure what they are exempt from. We, we don't know that they, you know, uh, have to meet that, like the setback, the dimensional controls, and some height requirements. Uh, other than that, we don't know what. Um, Presumably, our CPDC and or our ZBA zoning board know that if they go before them, and our lawyer knows that. Uh, both of our lawyers will know that. And, and um, we intend to stay. If, if the process moves forward, which again, our main goal is to make them go away, but if the process moves forward, we intend to have counsel every step of the way. I'm in. I'm a town meeting member. Everybody <laughs> wants. I'm going to definitely vote for, you know, because I'm really glad you've got the historical commission involved because I think they're really going to be a very large impetus of town meeting men, um, on November 10th. Now, when do you expect that to be voted on? The same day that it's, they, they, they probably won't vote on it the same day that it's brought in. Uh, to town meeting? Yes. Is that true? Well, that it depends, and I don't know how depends long the warrant the is and where it's going to fall. But it's usually only two nights subsequent town meeting. But it does need a two-thirds vote from town meeting, which can be a high bar. So it's very important that we do. I think it will vote for because it's important to the town. Yeah. That, it helps that would be great. Presidential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We got that question. I will. Yeah. Is the broker aware of the, is the broker aware of the stress and the distress? putting on the town, and if so, um, are they aware that once their name is known, it's going to also hurt their business in town? It's, it's it remains to be seen. She doesn't care. Could you, could you repeat that loud, Claire? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I said, is the broker aware of the distress that they're causing in town? And if so, once their name is known, isn't that also going to hurt the broker's business if they continue? With this and hurt their business in town. That remains to be seen. Okay. Can I just respond a little? I think she's more concerned about the structure of the cellar. What? What's that? Thirty years ago, the town block. There was a landlocked property mm -hmm. uh, and a paper street, a street mm -hmm. that was never put in. It just sort of looks like ordinary property. And uh, a party uh, with the owner wished to have that zone so that houses could be built in the middle of our block. And this would have been accessible from Summer Avenue, just north of Mineral, and the paper street came in from Prospect. Uh, so it could have been two streets, and Sally and Peter know about this, of course. Uh, so these, these situations sometimes can turn around on a completely unexpected point. And as I recall, the the consideration that killed that was that the fire chief pointed out that the, the road going into the, this new property would have to be so steep coming off summer, the turn would have to be so sharp, and the area in which a fire truck would have to turn around in there and maneuver that it was impractical fire-wise. And as I recall, that killed it. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. So these things can turn on on just a very unexpected point. This gentleman over here, I forget what you said, but you were getting in something about that, about usage, I think, the right. gentleman there with the black t-shirt. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we need to think about uh, everything, you know, like what time would the lights uh, have to go off? You know, would it become a nuisance to the neighbors because of noise, activity, uh, traffic? <coughs> so these are things we really want to keep in mind and feed suggestions in to mm -hmm. Mary Ellen and Catherine. <coughs> uh, so go ahead. Okay. Thank you. And we can you, we have our email address on our website. You can always you know take comments and notes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Christine. Yeah. Um, same lawyer we used to fight them all. By the way. Same lawyer what? Same lawyer we used to fight them all. Oh. Yeah. Um, 
One, is there openings on town meeting? Are there vacancies? Not at this point. Okay. Two, what are the hours of Criterion's other properties at the moment? That was asked at the uh, public hearing what the hours were, and that we kind of a fuzzy answer. It's in the eight to four range. Eight to four thirty, they said. It, it's not a school in the sense that there's a weeks, there's a drop off and a pickup. It doesn't work like that. They're not a they're not a school. By how we define it in our bylaws, I understand it's not a school. So it is really more of a social service agency. There's day long traffic and hours. they may. Yes. We haven't gotten to the point where we've gone over to Woburn yet. We have, you know, it, it's all very, very tight time frame. We've been trying to accomplish a lot since um, the, the demolition delay uh, was imposed. So that is one of the things that we do want to get to do is go over there and see exactly how they operate over there. Excuse me, she, the lady just said, are there seats available? But every town meeting, the first night, uh, any open seats, uh, anyone can come in and uh, offer their name uh, to occupy those seats for a, what is it, one year or three, two or three year. Uh, uh, right, it's more frequent in the spring, but right now, as, as far as I know, unless something comes up, the seats are all full. Really? Okay. It may change by November. What? I thought six of the still. Still has openings. Um, you can go on the town clerk's website at town meetings. Yeah. The list and see if there are. There's 24 over eight precincts. So it never hurts to show up on that first night okay. if you're looking to occupy the seat. Mm -hmm. There's a caucus of each okay. precinct. Where is it? In front of you. I can't see where it is. You have a question over there? I was curious. How much of the focus here is on preserving the existing home versus just opposing something like Criterion? To say, say the historic district doesn't happen, but say we are successful at pushing criterion up, <coughs> what's, like, what would ultimately happen to that home? I mean, it, 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 is there really a likelihood that someone would buy it and preserve it, or is it likely that it would be turned, torn down and kind of put up a, a new home? Well, I guess uh, for the first question is, what, what's the primary focus? Is it opposing there is, criterion there is a primary or both? Focus. It's a multi-prong. Right. It, we want to preserve the residential historic character of Summer Avenue. That's the overarching goal, which is to preserve the structure, keep residential use, get alternatives for both the seller and the buyer so they could, they're both happy you know, doing something else. Our understanding is that it was never offered out on the public market for sale as residential use. So by right, since the house was built in the eight, say around 1850, uh, it can by right become a two family or a duplex. Uh, they wouldn't even have to get a special permit for that. So there's other options. Uh, we also have a carriage house bylaw that Tommy adopted several years ago where uh, I think the owners living on the property can turn your carriage or carriage house into a residence. So there are residential um, options available that have not been explored. Another question right here? Um, I've signed a petition tonight, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering if there were any plans to broaden that um, uh, effort to get more names on that petition. And, you know, if we were all to leave with one form tonight and be able to send that back in, perhaps with a, a sample letter, I like this gentleman's idea, yeah. a sample yeah. letter that the uh, person who signed the petition could mm -hmm. then send to Criterion. I'm just wondering if, right. well, what, we how we can help with that, that would be petition. Great. That's great. We have, um, we garnered a few hundred signatures yesterday at the street fair. And um, presumably another 100 tonight, 400, and another uh, however many of them are here tonight. Um, and our intent is to keep getting them, but not, not for too long. I mean, we have to keep collecting signatures and to send them to Criterion and let them know um, what the numbers of people are like that are opposed to their plan. Um, and also to have that for town meeting support, to show the support that there is um, for the plan. So are you saying to, to take um, blanks to just have other people sign know. them? Uh, we well, could, we could do that, and we could put our uh, like a return address on the back for you, yeah. and a, a date when they need to be returned. We'd like to get sure. that would be terrific. And, and then if we I could, could get, walk around my neighborhood mm -hmm. and, and talk to people about it. We would absolutely appreciate that. We'd like to get many more signatures, and uh, probably within within two weeks, I would say we'd like to have them all gathered and 
we will we'll copy them and send them to Criteria, the Board of Selectmen, et cetera. Can we possibly see a show of hands of people here who would like to do that so that we could prepare ourselves to that? Yep. Can I suggest then that if you're interested, if you email our email address and say, please send me a blank petition and we'll send you a blank petition? Do we have any blank petitions? Well, we have can, well, on no, no, no. Send them. 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 Is the property subdividable so that the house could be preserved? <coughs> and the, I know this has been brought up, but is it subdividable so that their, you know, portion of it could be sold off at an even greater profit? Is that is that a possibility? Uh, uh, there's not enough. Uh, do we have the? No, it doesn't. We don't really have a slide that shows that. Uh, there had been a lot. Uh, well, it's currently three lots, three. and the, the, the long empty lot that has frontage on Summer Avenue would have been a buildable lot, but things were the proper steps weren't taken, and that didn't turn into a build that is not buildable. It doesn't meet neither lot currently meets any uh, meets the uh, frontage requirements, and even together or taking from either side. There's just not enough land for frontage. <coughs> well, what is needed for frontage? Because I know, you know, the one hundred house, a hundred, you know, the, the hundred feet house, um, right? Um, next to, there's a house behind there. Right. So is it just for the driveway, or no? There's an easement there. The, uh, we need a hundred feet, and there's just not enough. You can't. There's no Sometimes you could take enough if you don't increase the nonconformity in the adjacent lot, but that's just not <coughs> does not seem that that's going to work here. Everyone's a little short. Um, question: Has someone in the um, real estate world, sort of outside of this, but in Reading, been able to do some kind of an assessment? So if this were to go on the open market, you'd have a sense of what a young family who wants to rebuild a beautiful home and live in Reading might be asked to pay. Has that been done? Like, do we have a sense of that? Not formally, but there's a number of, I'm a realtor here in town, as is Cinda, and there's a number of us on the, on the committee. And, you know, collectively, we've, you know, kind of said it's probably would fall into, you know, in the seven, eight hundred thousand dollar range. So, and we think that the seller has agreed to spend a million? Under a million. Under a million. Somewhere under a million. Yeah. Right around that money. That, right around that mark is what the, the money is the deal that the all even on. That. So, my final question then is in the relationship with the lawyer who you've hired, is there, I know, as you've said, this is multi pronged. So, I know there's one way which is like, make it very expensive for them, for the seller, for the buyer, so they don't want to buy. But is there any conversation that's being attempted, and I understand it's, it's fraught with difficulty, right. but is there an attempt to get to the table and come to a meeting of the minds and try to get it on the open market? Is that at all happening? Yes, there's stuff yeah. going on all, all around the I know she has a purchase and sale agreement. Right, but so she has a purchase and sale, and so we can't just come to her with other offers and say, here, how about this, break your purchase and sale. But there are other, um, some anecdotal offers, some real offers, um, or people talking about things that they would do. And there are vehicles for us to communicate that to her. The Historical Commission is actually charged with working with the owner and seeking alternatives. Oh, okay. That's part of the demolition delay process. So, um, and we have someone on, or a couple of people on our in our group that are working with on alternatives. So we're trying different avenues to um, keep alternatives on the table. Great, thank you. Thank you. But if you know of anyone who would be interested, yeah. Let <laughs> 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 me give you my card. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman in the back. Yeah. So, Mr. Uh, my understanding. I, I haven't seen the, the actual plot plans that there are those two lots that are on, on those two plots of land that are on paper anyways uh, that are adjacent to that the lot that the house and the barn are on um, at least one of those is adjacent to the middle school am, am I correct? correct so would one of the potential avenues be for the town to purchase that as part land or to expand the middle school which would provide some relief to the uh, you know, that, that land is of value to the town, but not really to 
a buyer per se. Um, so that would that be one potential area of relief to the to the seller where uh, there would be some additional revenue that would offset, um, you know, would potentially enhance the revenue of the sale of this property. Well, a couple of points. That was uh, the, the seller of the property did try to sell that to Tom Sutherland many years back for a very high sum. That, if you look on the property assessment data on the town's website, that particular lot, it's, a, it's about 25,000 square feet. It's assessed at $5,300. So it's, it's not, you know, that, that you're not going to recognize any money, really, from selling that. And the other thing is that the people on Temple Street and a, at least one residence on Summer Avenue are, are very keen about those trees. And I'm sure the birds and the wildlife that live there, too, are very keen yeah. about those trees, too. So there's a lot that that provides to the neighborhood that's important to retain there. Um, but everything's on the table, yeah. I think. And whether or not there's been some discussions of eminent domain at all by, by the Board of Selectmen, I have no idea. So but we'll see. Question, any other questions? Kathy and then Rachel. How's the fundraising going? I know it's hard for you guys to stand up there and say uh, it's a very important component oh, here. It's, so. it's, not, it's not hard for us to say we're, just, <laughs> we're, just, we're prohibited because of the, of the lovely room that we're in. Right. Um, so I can say we're not doing any fundraising here. I mean, we can we can just say that you know that's a really important part of this that we really need critical. people to be donate. Legal costs. Right. Donate, yeah. donate, donate. I can tell you we had a, a booth yesterday at the fair. For those of you who came by, you know, and saw us, and um, you know, we, we did raise about a thousand dollars at the fair, so that helps. Um, you know, so, but more is better. <laughs> and and there are, there are a variety of ways to, you know, on the website and things of that nature, Facebook, and it's all there. The, uh, the, pa it may, the passage of the local historic district, that doesn't make this go away. It just makes it more difficult for them to do what they want to do. Is that right. correct? Right. Liz, did you have a question? I, I did. It, it goes back to the question about the funding of the criterion school uh, institution. Uh, if indeed it's grants from the uh, federal government or the state, who's to say when or if they would run out? And then what becomes of the building? Could it become a halfway house or something else that might be uh, less neighborhood friendly? There's lots of possibilities. Because even though the, I mean, the reality is, even though the underlying zones would stay residential, anyone coming in, you know, they have to go through the same process if they were a nonprofit of receiving Dover Amendment protection. Or you have someone, would they be willing to take down this kind of a huge big building to, to return it to residential use? That's unlikely. Right. So, right, I mean, who knows down the road what could happen? Yeah. Any other questions? Well, we want to thank everyone sincerely uh, for coming tonight. We